Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you had a good lunch. This is not going to be one of those post-lunch sessions where you can take it easy. Um, we've got Stefan Thomas, from, formerly at Google, and Jeff Turner at Facebook. I'm led to believe it's going to be a dynamic, interactive session. So my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible and try and get us all to finish roughly on time. So I'm going to sit down, get out of the way, and I'll hand over to Stefan and Jeff. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to start straight <laughs> away you. with a question for you. So if you're in your after-lunch stupor, too much wine, whatever, uh, a question for you, a rhetorical question. Maybe, yeah. So if you think about 2020, four years away, it's an easy phrase that comes off people's lips, but it's only four years away. 2020, how prepared, if you had to rate on a scale of one to five, how prepared would you say your L&D team and agenda is for 2020? Okay, you don't need to answer now. But I'd like you to, we'd like you to think about it, and we're gonna come back to that in the questions at the end. And I'll, if you're not gonna volunteer an answer at that time, I'll probably pick on one of you. We, we might not pick on people, but that's, we'll, we'll offer people to come in, but uh, like, let's not pick on, I'm scared oh, now. Like, like. <laughs> there are a couple in the audience I know that I might pick on. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fair enough. Very good. Okay. No, you know, you're right. We need to be. Yes, yes, that's right. So um, to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Jeff here. This is Jeff. Um, hey. Jeff, uh, Jeff is God of Learning and Development <laughs> at uh, Facebook in Amir. Um, I've known Jeff for a few years now. Yeah, yeah. And um, you've been with uh, Facebook for getting on for um, seven-ish years? Six years. Six. Yeah, yes. Six years. From 22 managers through to... What? There's over 300 managers now in Amir. So tremendous growth. Um, one of the oldies in the organization. When, uh, when I joined Facebook, uh, I was the second oldest person in Europe at the age of 42. Um, and the worst part was the oldest person looked younger than me. So I looked the oldest, but I was actually the second oldest. So, so great. interesting organization. Great. So thank you, Jeff. Okay, and this is Stefan. So again, myself and Stefan have met a, a number of times. So Stefan worked for Google. He was a global head of, um, global director of L&D uh, for Google for nearly eight years. Um, he semi-retired last year, but he's busier than ever. So, um, so Stefan set up his own kind of practice then as well. So. Great, thank you very much. Off you go. So, um, so we want to take you a bit of on, on a journey. I mean, this is the title for this. Um, the session is intended uh, to be perhaps a little different from the session so far today. So, you know, we're not gurus. Uh, we're not kind of vendors, uh, we're not from consultancies, um, we're practitioners. So we have some scars on our backs, you know, some experiences, things that worked, things that haven't worked, successes, failures, and you know, those things have developed a point of view and we wanted to share that point of view with you. And can I just say, um, we're not here to tell you what to do. Like that is not the point, we hope you disagree. Um, we hope that you argue and, and put your points across and challenge us, so I think that's really important. Absolutely. So if you think about us, um, we've got plenty of war stories and experiences, and what we'd like to do is to share some of those with you this afternoon. Um, and uh, Jeff, because he's here from Facebook, and Facebook is a great case study, we're going to talk a bit about Facebook, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about a few other things as well. Um, however, if you were <coughs> expecting a kind of a Google versus Facebook face-off type of <laughs> thing, um, you're in the wrong session. Yeah. Uh, we ain't going to do that. And we um, kind of like each other. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, that's true, that's true. And, um, and nor, you know, I'm, I'm not part of Google anymore, so I'm not here to represent Google. Um, there are people in the audience here who are, and I know who they are, so, um, but it's not my, you know, it's not my place to do that. But uh, I do have some perspectives, and particularly now I've left um, around some of what I would regard as potentially transferable organizational practice and things that aren't as well. So we ain't going to do that. Um, you know, between us, um, we probably have about 50-odd years, maybe more, uh, of experience, predominantly in tech organizations of one sort or another. Um, so Jeff over here with this kind of pedigree and set of experiences. Um, me on this side, most recently Google, other large US organizations. I chose these guys as a little example of one of the small outfits that I'm working with at the moment. I'm, I'm spending time with the new new, 
the people that are probably a real pain in the neck to many of your businesses in the audience. In other words, the disruptors um, who uh, are busy shaking things up. So, um, so I have some perspectives from that as well. So, let's start. Um, let's start. I want to reprise to start some of what's going on. And we're a good learning and development folks in this room, so we start with the business, of course. And if we think about you know, what's going on today, and we're not going to belabor this. We've had plenty of this already in this conference this morning um, from some of the sessions that I've heard. It's not you know, it's great stuff. But if you think of the intersection of what's going on today, um, whether it's the you know, ongoing and increasing spiraling pace of change in the business environment and the macroeconomic environment in which we all work in, um, whether it's the rise of geopolitical threats of one sort or another that are impinging on our businesses and on our society, whether it's demographic shifts and the changing aspirations of people in the workforce, uh, whether it's longer-term demographic shifts with some countries getting older and some countries getting younger, uh, China beginning to reap the reward of its one-child policy, uh, so in another decade or so they'll run out of labor for their workforce. Um, whether it's ch climate change, if you're sitting in one of the Pacific Island states, you're in big trouble in the next couple of decades ahead. Uh, all of those things are coming together in an alarming kind of perfect storm. Plus, of course, new technology. And new technology um, disrupting businesses and sectors, but also opening up the possibility to completely new products, services, paradigms, and so on. So the context in which we operate is an extraordinary, fast-changing, and very uncertain context. Um, if we think about learning and development then, so let's bring it down a step. And where we want to spend most of our time now is on learning and development. You know, there's so much clever new technology for us as a function and for us as professionals. This conference is stuffed full of um, new technology vendors, new platforms, new propositions, snake oil merchants of one sort or another that will provide you with the next big thing that will um, deliver um, to the promise that we make in organizations. So first of all, for learning and development, clever new technology. Secondly, you know, the whole rise of peer-to-peer -peer learning and social learning as the new accepted norm and paradigm for uh, learning and development in organizations, whether it's 70, 20, 10, whether it's you know, a focus on coaching and mentoring in organizations, whether it's some of the cool things that some of the people in the audience here did at Google around peer-to-peer -peer learning in the organization. I mean, this is the new norm. So the paradigm of you know, trainers and training functions and subject matter experts um, is beginning to wane. Uh, Stefan, can I just say that our, when we looked at our mission as an L&D organization, I, th I think it just links to that peer-to-peer -peer coaching. So, so our mission is to, is to connect those who have something to teach with those who are ready to learn. And that takes away the whole focus of this being an L&D, we hold the knowledge. The knowledge is out there in the organization. So if we can find the people who have something to teach and connect them with the people who are ready to learn, that's where the magic happens. Not, And I don't want to be disparaging to trainers and what. Uh, what all of our colleagues do, but I think that's where the real kind of buzz can happen. So, you know, L&D turning itself into the Yodas of the organization, you know, the, uh, the curators of content, you'll have heard much of this, I'm sure you've read much of it, I hope you're doing it already, you know, the facilitators of knowledge exchange, the coaches of others in the organization. Unfortunately, our businesses aren't perhaps quite in the same place, you know, they just want training courses in many cases. Um, they want to take a training pill that will make them better and mm. will do things for them. Um, but we know the truth, that that's not how it's working now. So technology, social, peer-to-peer -peer learning, this transformation of what a learning and development is and the expectations of the business. Um, and then, you know, this, um, what I would regard as kind of, or frame as meta-level challenges. So, you know, we spent, as a profession, you know, decades, if not longer, on things like skills development, uh, knowledge transference, getting better at these sorts of things, behavioral change. 
but really in the world that's around us now, it's kind of more higher level capabilities in the organization are going to be the ones that count more. So the ability for an organization to have the kind of shock absorbers that it needs to be able to deal with uncertain futures. This is really potentially where the big value for learning and development is. So if we take ourselves up a level and think about what some of those things might be for organizations. So to do that, we're going to look a little bit at Facebook mm -hmm. and hear a little bit of Jeff's story here and, uh, and talk a little bit about how Facebook thinks about these sorts of things. Very good. Thank you, Over Stephen. to you, my friend. Very good. Yeah, so um, again, let's not be disparaging about the work that we do around competencies, skills, knowledge, etc. That's, that's, that's base level. Like, that's that's your, your table stakes. I think where L&D can really make the biggest difference, really get at, at the table, at the top table, is when we start to look at, as, as you said, about the meta uh, capabilities. And um, what I'm going to do is, is take you through work we've been doing to try and find out why teams are successful. Why teams are more successful in Facebook than other teams. And there is dozens of articles. There are books all over the place that, that tries to, to, tries to understand and explain that. Um, and none of them actually tie up together. There's themes, um, but none of them actually tie in together and there's no right one way of doing it. So what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do in Facebook is find out what is that secret source within Facebook that makes some teams much more effective than others. Let me just um, give you a little bit of background. So this is, for those of you who know Facebook, who use Facebook, you will recognize that this is not a meme. This is actually me and my family. This is my profile picture. Um, now the interesting thing there is not so much about my daughters and my wife, but is the thing I've circled here. So currently I have 1,376 Facebook friends, and of which I've obviously I'm close to all of them, I speak to them every day. <laughs> Not at all. The interesting part about this is most of those are my colleagues. And I think this is what we'll refer to later on. I just wanted to, I want to signpost that at the start. Most of my Facebook friends are my colleagues, and for some organizations that is a complete and utter nightmare. Um, a lot of organizations keep work and private completely separate. I'm going to ask, I'm going to challenge that uh, as I go through this. A little bit about Facebook. Well, the big F is in the middle, you know, um, but it's not just about Facebook. Our mission is to help the world become more connected and help people to share. Simple. That's it. It always has been. Um, one of the interesting things about Mark as a leader is that he never started Facebook to be a company. Now, I know everyone's going to be like, I was skeptical, but he never, it was never meant to be a company. It was a way for him to connect in Harvard Business School with people around him. And we actually make, pro uh, we actually make money to build products rather than make products to, build, to make money. So it's the opposite way around. And I, I understand if people are skeptical or even cynical about that, but honestly, that's, that's how we see it. But there's a group of products there. So is, these are all monthly active users. Um, so we have a billion people plus using our groups um, Facebook groups. You can see this is actually out of date because yesterday uh, we announced that WhatsApp now have a billion people using WhatsApp every month. Um, Facebook, the big F is in the middle. Facebook Messenger, 800 million people using it. And then Instagram, 400, uh, 400 million people using it. So the, so, and we don't do anything else. We just help people to connect in different ways and share, um, uh, share different materials, different information. The one that isn't on there that I'm going to talk about later on is Oculus. Because I think, uh, so Oculus, let me just, just explain. Oculus is a company we bought which specializes in virtual reality. And I think that changes everything. Absolutely everything. If we get that right, just, just rip up the, the old books and start again. Because th I think that could be the thing that, that changes the way that human beings communicate forever. If we get it right. So that's a little bit about Facebook and the products. Well, I'm often asked, well, what's it like to work there? Um, so these are some of the posters that, that if you um, come into our offices, you see these posters around, you know, um, proceed and be bold, move fast, think wrong. This journey is 1% finished. Uh, just, these are sayings that, we've, that, we've, uh, that we believe reinforce our, our culture. We believe that our culture is the strongest thing. It's the thing that we, we hold on to most dearly. 
Um, and that's driven by five values. And the five values, uh, the first one, the first two talk about how we do things. So the first one is focus on impact. So everything is about impact, it's not about hours. There's no kind of presenteeism. Um, you can come to work whenever you want to, and I'll talk a little bit about that and some of the pros and cons of that. Um, the second one is move fast. So continually move, continually change. Um, how we do it, we ask people to be bold. We ask people to make mistakes, which is, which is interesting when you join a company which is saying we expect you to, to make mistakes. Um, we ask people to be open. Um, so that's open to feedback, open to giving feedback, open to new things. And the last one, which is a, it's a little bit difficult to understand, is, is to build social value. And that's inside and outside of work. So what we mean by that is to, is to help people to make a difference, make a difference for themselves, make a difference for their family, make a difference for their community, maybe through SMBs or through companies. So, so it's building social value, building trust. Um, and then a lot of people say, well, okay, I get that, values are on the wall. What does it really mean? What, like, like, come on, tell us what it really means. So for me, and this is my own personal thing, I think the I, I put it down in two words. So the first one is freedom. And I'll take you back to my very first interview um, with Facebook. And um, so I go to the interview and I'm all kind of nervous. But, it, but back six years ago, Facebook was kind of a, a, a dating site for college kids. It was like, you know, there wasn't a huge amount going on there. Um, so so I, I went there, I was working for O2 at the time. I said, look, let's cut this short, you know? I, like I, I live a couple of hours away from the office. so. Like, I'm not going to be in the office nine to five. What's your working from home policy? And you have to use your um, imagination here because I'm going to leave out a word, but you can probably guess what it is. So the recruiter just looked at me and she went, uh, we haven't put in the word, got one. Um, which was interesting because I'd never been sworn at in an interview before. Um, and I said, well, like, is that good or bad? You haven't got a working from home policy. And she just said, like, why would we care where you work? And I'm like, I don't know, but most companies do. And she said, listen, if you, if you don't do your work, we'll find you and fire you. But, <laughs> but if you do it, why would we care? And I was like, oh, now, now I'm confused. Um, and six years on, or nearly six years on, you know, it's true. Now, there are certain roles where you have to be in the office, you know, that, like, that's, but there's complete freedom about when and where you do your work, providing you do it. It's all about focus on impact. It's not about hours, it's about impact. Um, so I think that's the, 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 the first kind of thing that, that, that Facebook means to me. Now there's a downside. Um, so what we found from uh, giving people this freedom and not saying you're working from there till here is that people continue to work. And one of the things that we're working on and one of the skills that we're trying to work on with our people is to, is to understand when to turn off. Because technology we're talking about is, is a blessing and a curse. When I first started work, we had a first and second post there was nothing else, you know? You knew the work you had to do by 11 o'clock in the morning. But now we're, we're, we're on all the time. I watch my daughters and they're just constantly connected. So unless people can get the skill of knowing when to stop, then what we find is that suddenly their work just, just continues into their personal life. It's an interesting challenge. <laughs> the second one is authenticity. I didn't make that slide. That was his slide. Um, uh, but so you used it. I know. Yeah. I couldn't find a better one. Um, so authenticity is like just be yourself, you know. And again, that sounds a little bit strange. Like most people be themselves, but it's quite difficult. So you can wear what you want. That is probably a little OTT and might get a HR comment. But um, but you can wear what you want. There is no dress code. Dress code is not casual. It's dress code is wear what you want. So if you want to wear a shirt and tie, then wear a shirt and tie. But be your authentic self. I had a great, good friend um, who works for Innocent Drinks. I, and he moved from JP Morgan. And I said, why did he move? That's a bit of a, um, a bit of a, like a brave move. And he said, I am weary, or I was weary of wearing the mask that wasn't me. And for me, that, that sings the what, Generation Y, and there's a lot of talk about what they are, but you know, they want to be themselves. Um, and if you think about Facebook, the product, Facebook was product was the first place where people started putting pictures of them real selves and pictures of their real family online. Previous to that, MySpace and, uh, and AOL even, 
we all had handles, football one, two, three, or Johnny, whatever, you know? It didn't matter, but you never actually put anything up about yourself. But Facebook was the first place where you could be your authentic self. And I think some organizations find that quite difficult. Um, so I was talking, because if, you, if you're gonna have people be their authentic selves, then they're going to disagree with you. Does that make sense? So, so if, you're ex if you're asking people to be themselves, don't expect them to fit into your culture don't expect them to fit in. They should challenge everything. I went to... Um, Jeff, so this is all very easy for a Facebook, but, mm. um, but for a lot of people in the audience here, they don't work in Facebook-type cultures. So what, what's holding other organisations back to be able to people, to allow people to be their authentic selves and to feel that sense of freedom that you feel? So, so it, it's cult I believe. Right? I believe it's cultural. So, so I, I think as an example I can give, um, I was asked to talk about bias and diversity for Lloyds Bank, for, the, for pretty senior people in Lloyds Bank. And I got the invite, and the invite actually said, um, uh, straight after work, so business dress. And I'm like, wow, business dress, for me that's t-shirt and jeans, I'm actually wearing, I'm actually posh today. Um, but that's t-shirt and jeans. So, um, so I turn up, it's in the gherkin, it's really posh, and I turn up in a pair of jeans, t-shirt, and a pair of trainers. And uh, I'm stood next to one of the other speakers, and um, a lady comes up to me, and this isn't about the lady, it's about bias, it's about um, cultures. And she taps me on the shoulder and she goes, uh, excuse me, um, the televisions aren't working. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. She said, can you have a look at them? I said, I can, but I'm not really good at televisions, to be honest with you. And uh, she said, can you, can you ask one of your people to look at them? And I'm like, I've got no people here, I'm sorry. Um, and then the, another speaker said, listen, we're the speakers. And she's like, I'm really sorry. And literally within five minutes, another lady came up and said, or oh, introduced herself to the speaker, looked at me and, and didn't even put out a hand, but said, are you Paul's helper? You know? And I'm like, no, I'm not actually. But that's, that's I think, mm -hmm. an example of where it's difficult because the culture is going to stop people from being authentic. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and we're very fortunate in Facebook that Facebook is started by a 32-year-old. You know, he's only 32 now. So he, he, he doesn't, the, the culture in Facebook um, has always been like this. How do you change it? I think it's difficult, but you have, to, you have to ask the leaders what actually do they want from their company. I think it has to start with the leadership team. And that's difficult because a lot of them, are, they look and sound, maybe not sound, but they look like me. They, most of them are white, middle-aged men, you know. Sorry, but that's the truth. Okay. So I think those are the two words that uh, sum up uh, for me, Facebook. Um, now, what do we do? Uh, and again, let's not be disparaging to, to competencies, but I think we can do better. I think we can do better in learning and development by going after the stuff that nobody's done before. So what we've done um, over the last six months is that we've tried to identify what is it that is a special secret source uh, for Facebook teams that make them better. And this is probably not right for your teams, but it, uh, hopefully it'll make you think. Um, so what did we do? We did focus groups. We identified 10 of our, our top teams. We did focus groups um, with a professor. Um, and then we, we surveyed the same teams and, and, and we triangulated those two outputs with, with the theory. And this is what we came up with. Some of the main themes um, that we found make teams special. So change is constant. Um, somebody actually said change is like breathing. You just don't even notice it anymore. There are no program managers. Um, people are outside of their comfort zone most of the time because change is constant. And one of the great questions that was asked for me is, when was the last time you volunteered to go outside of your comfort zone in work? You know, and that that would be a really good indicator of how your, your company deals with change. Because it, going outside of your comfort zone is risky. Going outside of your comfort zone means you might fail. And therefore, if you, it, if you're not gonna volunteer if there's, a, if there's a big issue if you fail. But also, you're not gonna learn. So there you have this paradox between like, I can't go outside because it's too risky, but where I really learn, I believe, is when I'm outside of my comfort zone and I'm supported. So how, do you, how does your organization deal with failure? How does it deal with change? And does that allow people to really learn? So what we found in Facebook is that our teams were constantly changing, but they were constantly failing. 
However, there, there, uh, conflict after failure was really welcomed. But it's not personal conflict. It's not about the person. It, it, it's about what do we do next? Again, this is counterintuitive, but they didn't spend much time on reviewing what went wrong. We were like, hang on a second, that's in the literature. Do put, like post-implementation reviews. It's like, they don't do that. Our best teams just go, okay, we're in this situation. What do we do next? Not who did it or why did it happen? It's like, what do we do next? And we think the conflict is, is absolutely vital. So how good is your organization at conflict? We aren't the best. We still have lots of work to do, but, but we're, we're pretty good at it. And we, use our, we use some of our products to help with conflict. We have very open discussions um, on our groups. So, you, so everybody is expected to weigh in if you have an opinion. And if you haven't got an opinion, there's no point complaining about it. You know, either weigh in or move on. So diversity, I spoke a bit about diversity. Um, it's, it's really important for a lot of companies now. What we noticed with our top teams is that they were very diverse. There, there was an equal uh, split, roughly equal between men and women. Um, there was loads of nationalities, there were different languages, etc. The one thing they ha all had in common is that they had the same values. Um, they had the same values about Facebook, but more importantly, they had the same values as the team, so that they, so when people were interviewing and they didn't actually know this, when they were interviewing, they were interviewing more for values than they were for competence. Um, and when we asked them to try and describe what the values were, they found it really difficult, but they could see it in their team colleagues. Um, so where we're moving to now is to help the teams identify what that team's values are, so now they can consciously go looking for those values rather than looking for competence. Competence is almost like a given, as I said at the start. You know, you don't even get at the table unless you're competent. But more importantly, do I have the same value? Does this person have the same values as I see in my team? If they do, they're going to be good. If not, then they, they don't get in, no matter how competent they were. Every team talked about strengths. And this is not competence. So strengths in Facebook does not, and I know this is, probably de different to the definition you've had as you're growing up but strengths in Facebook is about what you're passionate about like I am very competent at filling in expenses claims <laughs> but if you give me that job to do all day every day I'm leaving you know what are you passionate about if you can find out what people are passionate about and what they're good at then suddenly the magic happens but, it's, but we think it's more important to find out if they, even if they're slightly deluded about how good they are if they're passionate about it they will become better they will learn, they will read, they will practice, and they will become better. So all of these teams um, were focusing on what they do best and, and what they're passionate about. The big one um, came all the way through. And this, again, you're probably looking at this going, I, I, I've read all this in the literature. Yeah, so, so if you look at Lencioni, he says the, the bottom foundation is, is trust. Um, all throughout the teams, they trusted each other from a competence point of view, didn't even come on there, but they trusted that they were all going in the same direction. They trusted the goals, even though the goals constantly changed, not constantly, changed regularly, they believed that they were all going together. And what we saw then was something that was new. And this is what we didn't expect. Like we expected the themes to be there. If you look at all the books, those themes are there. What we found with our teams is that they're bigger than the normal. If, so the literature says teams start to break down between 10, 15 people. You, it doesn't matter which one you read. But after that, you start to have clicks, you know, like people, like people gather together. We were having teams up to 65 that were working effectively together. And, and that was like, whoa, that's different. Why is that happening? Um, and we think that's happening um, because the trust was stronger. I'll come to the reason for that now. When you put all this together, they looked like a virus. The, our teams were acting like viruses. They were acting like complex adaptive systems. They were working out what is the most effective thing, and then they were moving in this direction, and then suddenly, if that's not the most effective thing, without anybody telling them, without anything from the top, they were changing and going, actually, we need to go over here. Forget that, we need to go over here. So they were changing themselves 
rather than waiting for somebody else to change. And, and, and my contention is that most teams don't do that. Most teams will wait for direction before they actually stop and move. Um, what we were seeing from our teams is that what was making them, our teams really successful is that they were acting on their own volition. So what do you think is the secret sauce? We've yet to prove this. And this, this, is be, this will be controversial. Um, but I think one of the, the things that is the secret sauce is Facebook the product. Let me explain why. Um, so Facebook the product, as, as I mentioned at the very start, I have 1,346 friends. Facebook the product allows me to, to know those people better than I've known any of my colleagues before. I know when they're happy, I know when they're sad, I know when they're celebrating, I know when they're bereaving. I know them as a person. And I think that makes the trust much stronger when you get into difficult situations with people that you're working with. I didn't know anything about my colleagues before. Um, but now I know, them, I know them better. I still don't know them really well, but I know them better than, I, than I've ever known them before. And in 2004, Facebook, our mission has never changed to make the world more open and connected. In 2014, we started on a, a, um, a process to help make the workplace more productive and connected. And we have a new product called Facebook at Work. And Facebook at Work, uh, this is a technology um, conference and it only came out Monday, so a lot of people won't know about this, but Facebook at Work allows people to use the benefits of Facebook without the personal part, which we think that, you know, it's just, unless you're Facebook, that probably wouldn't work. So, unashamedly plugging it. Bit of an advert, Jack. I know. Bit of an advert. I know. But um, I think it's relevant, you know, because... I, I'd I, like to say something, though. Yeah, because of you may be sitting there thinking that um, this is a bit of an advert for Facebook, but um, um, there's um, a traditional US organization, so traditional business incumbent, been in business for 150 years, um, who's rethinking their performance management system. Many, everybody's rethinking their performance management systems. But these guys are thinking about going, moving from individual performance, which we all do, team performance, which there's some appetite for in some organizations, but taking that further to network performance. So what's my impact across the <coughs> network of relationships and collaborations that I've got across the organization? And where's the data to support whether either I'm good at it or lousy at it, and how does that tie into the goodies that I get in the organization? Whether it's reward, whether it's development, whether it's, you know, the, so, so extending the notion of performance management from being a very Western, um, individualistic, centric kind of paradigm into team and then into network performance, the impact across the enterprise and mm -hmm. in, in across the, the, the estate. And I think, what you do and what's going on here serves as a super example of that kind of progressive thinking. Mm. Um, we'll come back to that in, in a short while. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'm not going to spend very long on this, but just to let you know it's there. Um, sorry, we'll just go back. If, if it's, no, it's, Actually, it's not there. It's um, facebook.com forward slash work. If anybody's interested, you can see it there. You can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the commission. Um, but, but, but what it does, it, if, you, if you can use Facebook, you can use Facebook at work. Um, it allows you to set up groups. It allows you to have chat. Um, it, the news feed in there is, is, uses an, um, an algorithm which finds out your most p important people. So if your boss posts something, <laughs> it goes straight to the top of your list. Um, so, so you can see the things that are most important to you. That's it. I think it's okay. over to you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so hopefully, well, first of all, thanks, Jeff. Um, I think... I'll be back. He's not finished. <laughs> he's not finished. Um, I mean, it's a super story. Um, there are other super stories out there. There are other organizations that are thinking progressively, but I think it's a super story that illustrates and, and, and services, or sur services as um, the kind of bit of data and evidence to make the point. If you remember before we started to talk about Facebook, we were, I talked about meta-level capabilities. Mm -hmm. Everything that Jeff has been talking about here has been playing at that kind of level and in the organization. And as we think about the years ahead and the kind of challenges our organizations face, our contention is that this is really where we need to focus from a learning and development perspective. Where, you know, if the starting point of this, uh, this session was, you know, how do we stay relevant to the business? How are we critical for the culture? How are we going to stay, you know, a key enabler of future growth? It's by playing at these top level, these kind of meta level capabilities. So let's talk a little bit about tomorrow. Um, 
And you know, much has been made of this kind of stuff. Um, if we start again at a business level, and then we're going to go down into L&D, and hopefully we'll end up at a place where we can talk about us, learning and development professionals, and where we play. Um, you know, much has been made of all of this. Um, you know, it's um, a big driver in many sectors. You know, we have robo-financial advisors already on websites, and people who will answer your mobile phone queries, who allegedly are humans, who of course aren't. Um, there's an outfit, a very interesting outfit, called Clara Labs in Silicon Valley. Clara will create an artificial intelligence bolt-on for your Outlook or for your email accounts, and will, for all intents and purposes, will look like um, your administrator and PA, will communicate in natural language with people that you're talking to on email, um, will set up meetings with them, will know what Jeff's favorite restaurant is, what kind of beer he likes, um, and will set it up. Extraordinary. I mean, just extraordinary. Um, so machine learning, and if we think about where machine learning might take us from an L&D perspective, the second big one, of course, that we know all about is big data and what big data is doing for organizations, you know, whether it's providing a level of you know, meta-level aggregation of insight in a way that we haven't had before in organizations. Um, if we think, about, we think about analytics in learning and development, most people are still parked in the space of um, evaluation, ROI, and all of those worthy things, that, which are worthy things. It's not meant in a judgmental way. But if we think about the next decades ahead, if we think about what kind of insight and what kind of proposition and products that we as learning professionals in the organization could synthesize and come up with, we need to get to grips with these kinds of things as well. Um, the kind of uberization of business is going to be profound. And um, you know, what I mean by that is, is more and more sectors. I mean, these guys, Uber, Airbnb, and so on, are at the, the thin end of a wedge. But essentially, the proposition that you don't need capital in the way that you needed capital to run your business. Capital intensive industries and paradigms are on the wane. You don't need a bucket load of equity or investment um, to finance industries in the way that you needed to in the past. Somebody can just set it up, Cloud, uh, crowdsource expertise in a way that they haven't had before. Even if you're sitting in some big traditional industry with long life cycles, whether it's the oil industry or these others, this trend over the next decades is going to be really profound. You won't need to have capital to run your business in the way that you've had to have capital to run your business in the past. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, the kind of capital-free new economic model or capital-light economic model. You know, who knows you know, where the future of work will take us with the impact of new technologies like these technologies. I want, Jeff, you want to say something about this again? Because yeah. I think, just say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we bought a company um, called Oculus. Uh, you may or may not have heard of them. Um, they do virtual reality. Now, now, I don't know if you've seen virtual reality, but it is scary. So you, just, so you put on these goggles, and you, you know you're in the office, like, you know? Um, but you put on the goggles, and you look around, and you could be anywhere, literally anywhere. There's one that you do, uh, that you look around, and you can see blue sky, and then you look down at the end, at the, on the end of a skyscraper, and literally you see everybody step back. It's that good. It, you know that you're in the office, but it fools your mind. So... What's it going to be like in five years' time? If it's like that now, what's it going to be like in five years' time? Imagine a place where you have no offices. You don't need offices anymore. Because if I need to meet Stefan, I would just stay in my house or on my beach or wherever I am, and we can meet anywhere we want to in the world, and it'll make it happen. Um, so you, so you, you don't need offices. You don't need people commuting because you can just meet. Um, what does that mean for work visas? You know, suddenly the globe, the globe becomes completely open. What does that way mean for the way that people work with organizations? Probably people become more transient than they ever have before. Less loyal, I can get business anywhere I want to. The best people will get the best jobs, but everywhere, anywhere in the world. What does that mean to leadership? You know, you no longer, and I don't know if this is right, but it could be that you don't see any of your people anymore. You, virtual reality with them. What does that mean for L&D? Wow. 
you know that that then I believe could be the challenge that we that is it's like the tsunami out there that is coming up we just haven't got our heads around yet the, the, the speaker this morning said I'm closing down my Facebook account because I don't own all of this stuff that's completely cool that's Facebook now in Facebook in four or five years time is going to be this it's not going to be like phones will be gone in six seven years we'll be going no oh, do you remember that old stuff you know the new technologies re replaced it and it I think it could be something like this so 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 artificial intelligence hollowing out traditional roles particularly service type roles big data providing a level of aggregation and insight we haven't had pre previ previously new technologies like these kinds of things I mean really you know where is the organization going to be? Where is your organization? Where's your industry sector going to be in a few years' time? Um, so, you know, actually, if we go back a couple of hundred years, you know, there are some old truths that are real truths. Um, you know, so really in this world, you know, what's going to count is, is adaptability. The ability of an organization to be able to adapt to fast pace and changing circumstances. Who knows how these technologies and these dynamics will come together. So for us as a learning and development function, you know, where can we play? You know, we have a finite set of resources. So many people, so many dollars, so much capex, so much brain space, so much attention span. Where should we play in this world? What do we think is going to make the biggest difference for organizations? So I think our con contention and our provocation to you this afternoon is it's at these levels. You know, it's at the kind of levels that we've been talking about. Jeff talked a lot about authenticity there. You know, authenticity, um, change leadership, being able to deal with ambiguity, um, learning agility. If we could help our organizations with these things, then really we unlock the keys to long-run organizational performance. So if I look at most L&D organizations, it's kind of interesting having been in the soup, swimming in the soup of Google, coming out, working with a number of different organizations now. It's not where most organizations play. Most organizations play with time to productivity, got to get people on board faster, uh, play with skills acquisition, you know, play in the space of we've got to move a bit of knowledge from somebody's brain to somebody else's brain, quicker, faster, better. But those things are really short-term and transient. The L&D functions, if really they're going to be the keys to the, uh, the future and success, need to play at some of these higher levels. The trouble is, there are barriers. Plenty of barriers to some of this stuff. People put people in boxes in life. Um, they put people in boxes in organizations. You know, we expect the learning and development function to do this. We expect the HR function to do that. Then out of IT comes this knowledge management function that wants to play in this space. And oh yeah, then we've got talent as well. And um, you know, most organizations have terrible silos and barriers that um, get in the way of some joined up and holistic thinking. And I don't know if that kind of grinds your gears or not, but you know, as I look at organizations, most of the setup and the most of the way organizations think about these things are basically dysfunctional. They're not trying to solve problems at that kind of metal level. They're trying to solve problems at a lower level of granularity. But just because things are the way they are doesn't mean they have to be that way in the future. In fact, that kind of thinking is a recipe for disaster. Um, so the past doesn't equal the future. You're all learning professionals in this room, so it's incumbent on you. There is no escape, my friends. It's incumbent on you to try and figure out ways to play at this more meta level in organizations. Because if you don't, then you're not living up to the potential and proposition of what you should be doing as learning professionals for organizations. So. You know, um, Peter Drucker was the first one, I think, although probably that's debatable, but anyway, was the first one who, who really brought the, the notion of culture as a key organizational imperative into kind of business kind of life and made a lot of money writing books on it and so on with his culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, this guy, Kurt Kaufman, has written another book recently, Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch. 
Um, I think, you know, our contention would be actually the culture eats strategy, eats everything before it. You know, the kind of culture that you can create in your organization that has that level of agility, that has employee goodwill and buy-in, um, that has the level of kind of, you know, uh, insight into thinking of the future is really the ones that will be the ones that will have long-run success. Trouble is, I mean, these are pulled from this book. I mean, if that really is true, if it really is true, that, and these are terrible averages, I'm sure it's not like that in Facebook or in Google or in other companies, but if, that's, if those companies aren't like that, somebody else is far worse. So they're averages, masking all sorts of sins. But really, if 23% of employees in organizations are at best passengers, huh, I don't really give a damn, 35% are actively disengaged. That really is the state of the business environment in which we operate in, and we haven't got a chance. We haven't got a chance to play at some of those meta levels and some of the dealing with some of the kind of cultural dynamics. We have to do something about this. Why? Because culture is everything. Yeah. Culture is the environment in which a company's strategy, brand, will thrive or die. You know, culture makes whatever an organization's strategy real. Culture attracts talent, it brings the right people on board. You know, it either energizes people or it drains the life out of them. So L&D playing as a key cultural enabler is a critical component of the future for organizations. So, you know, this is a double-edged sword, really. Um, on the one hand, we have a marvelous opportunity to help organizations future-proof themselves for whatever is to come. On the other hand, you know, we have terrible challenges. You know, we have our day jobs. We have, you know, demands from the business. Um, we have, you know constraints around us, whether the boxes our organizations put us in in, in, um, in in our kind of professional capacities. But really, the opportunity is here before us. I would urge you all to think about where you're spending your time, where you're spending your dollars, or your pounds, or your euros, where you're spending your headcount, and whether you're spending any of it, or what proportion of it you're spending on some of these meta-level capabilities and some of the cultural drivers. Because if you're not, then it's a bit provocative, but I would argue that your business at best is going to just shrivel on the vine in the long run, in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. You've got to find ways of freeing up space and time to focus on some of these things. So that's kind of the end of the formal bit. What we wanted to do was to provide an opportunity to do some Q&A. You can talk about Facebook, other things, other organizations, whatever you like. Um, I want to go back, though, to the question we posed at the beginning, that rhetorical question, which isn't rhetorical anymore. So, you know, if you think about 2020, that was the time frame we set. It's only four years away. It's actually on the horizon. It's not very long distance away. You know, the question was, you know, how ready are you for 2020? How ready are you for you for some of the dynamics of this world? Do you have strategies? Do you have plans? What are you doing to drive some of that environment in the organization? What are you doing to build and inculcate some of those meta-level capabilities in the organization? How do you rate yourself today? Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Lots of really interesting stuff there, ladies and gentlemen, I think. The question is not a rhetorical question, so I would encourage you to actually uh, get your thinking caps on and your megaphones out and maybe feed back and give some responses to uh, Stefan and Jeff. Anybody want to be the first to uh, engage with that? There's a lady down here. Have we got a microphone and, or somebody that can move that around for us? Did you all hear that? The challenge was, should we be getting ready for next year, 
not 2020, because things are moving that rapidly. Is that right? And that was the challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, th I, think, I think you have to do both. I think that uh, you have to have a point of view as to where this stuff can go. I think you're right. Like, how, how could you even think of, I, I'll be working in Facebook when the internet didn't exist when I left school? <laughs> Just like, <laughs> um, so I think you have, to, you have to take a bet. So if we take Facebook, Mark took a big bet on going mobile because Facebook was purely on, like, on the computers. But he made a bet to say, I think everything is going to go mobile, and, and we moved in that direction. If we hadn't, we probably wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now. So I think you, you have to have a point of view, and, and, but be ready to change if, if your point of view is wrong. Yeah, um, yeah I think there are two pieces to that, really. Uh, one is, um, I agree with that completely. We have to have a point of view. We have to have a point of view about where we want to place our bets and where... Um, we think the things that will enable the organization in the next year or two to enable that, that future. But, 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 or and, not but, and we need to have a very agile and iterative approach. So it's kind of like that, you know, they, as an organization or as an L&D function, you're kind of like on a train on a train track, you know, and, you know, the train track, you know, is stretching out in front of you, I think, in a lot of people's organizations. Um, instead of that, it's a different metaphor. You've got, you're on, the train tr on a train track and it's heading down the line. The trouble is there is no train track in front of you. Instead, what you want is a guy on the front of the train laying down the next bit of track. So that gives you the kind of adaptability and agility to move things as, as you go. So that kind of metaphor. But, but still, you need to know whether your train is heading this way or this. Exactly, that's right. Where you yeah. see yourself. So yes. I don't want to even see a vision there yes. because that might ruin where I should go. Yes. But Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I, I had a wonderful vision there, um, uh, this will probably resonate for the Brits, of the Wallace and Gromit the, the, yeah, yeah. On, the, exactly. on the train, right. exactly. the, tracks, the track going down and mm -hmm. literally laying their own pathway out as they went yeah, along. Yeah. And it was happening so quickly and rapidly. Yes. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Lady here. Uh, can I ask both of you a question? Um, and I don't know whether you can answer it given the organisations that you've worked for. Um, but do you think it's possible to build a, a, a team with the secret source uh, within a deeply conservative, risk averse organisation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll take some of that now. Um, so. Um, I originally quit Google to spend my time working with the kind of the new new, the small little tiddler disruptors, and um, I rather naively thought that that was the new world. Actually, what I've discovered, th those people are very interesting, but there's a different category. There's kind of like the new old. So there are old organizations who really, either for, you know, defensive reasons, because, you know, you're in the banking sector and all these damn little mobile apps are eating your lunch, or more progressively, uh, have the prescience to realize that their world is changing. There are, there are old organizations who are absolutely up for changing their culture and their way of thinking of things. Um, I think a lot of that comes from a Jeff, uh, point that Jeff made earlier on from their leadership and the, real, you know, the insight and vision that their leadership have, but there are organizations that are doing this. And if yours isn't, then um, I would argue you're in trouble because some of your competitors will get it sooner or later. To answer your question more specifically, the way that I would do that and the way that I've seen some companies do it is to experiment, is to experiment, you know, find a place and a space in the organization where actually you can try some things out and do it differently, where actually you've got the permission or it's over the horizon and nobody really cares too, too much, where you can experiment in a way that you couldn't experiment in the mainstream heart of the business. You've got to be able to show the impact of the approach, so you have to find a place for that kind of experimentation. I agree completely. Um, the, the, the bank I was talking to, uh, we've actually agreed that we'll, we'll do some stuff with their digital team. So it just feels like that we can play a bit there, or they can play a bit there when we can help if we can, you know. But um, it's going to be tough. You know, I'm sorry. Like, I have no... Yeah. We have another question. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited by the, the options of virtual reality, and I think at the moment the applications are very conservative. Yeah. They're sort of trying to mimic the reality. But I'm very struck by the sort of image you were giving in terms of future teams where you could be in, at home in your pajamas, actually in a board meeting or, or other things. Mm -hmm. Because I'm as hearing your drivers in terms of what were the high-performing teams within Facebook. And connectivity, or that, that sort of aspect, was not one of the drivers. Mm. There was a lot of things around culture, about common values. 
And I'm wondering whether you can build up those common values where you can just simply switch the whole team on and off on a switch of a button. And so I'm sort of wondering how do you maintain the ingredients of a good team with technology that enables you to elect when you are in and when you're out? So a, a fantastic question. I, I don't know if the drivers of a good team will still be the drivers of a good team when virtual reality come in. I think we probably have to rip up the book and start again. So it's, and I don't even know if that's going to happen. The lady asked about what are you doing? I don't know what's going to happen. But I have a point of view that I think it will. And, and things like leadership, things like teamwork, things like, um, things like even contracts to companies, things like who you work with, where you work, I think we start again almost. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen. But I think if it does, then the people in this room will, will, will have a lot of pressure to help the organisations get ready for it. I, I, I think they'll be different. Um, I think we need to do things differently if that happens. I think it's not just the, uh, the, uh, the kind of opportunity of that kind of thing. You combine that with artificial intelligence. So you think about your, our existing teams today, you know? So, you know, we've kind of retrofitted face-to-face -face team and people management stuff into a virtual environment. So now I need to do remote coaching or over a VC or, or whatever, but it's still the same old paradigm. We're still trying to make that work in that world. In this new world, that's right, the paradigm completely shifts, but actually part of your team may not be human beings anymore. I mean, part of your team, I mean, why not? I mean, you know, why do you need L&D business partners or advisors? And there's a provocative statement. I'm sure many of you are potentially L&D business partners. But in a, you know, a lot of what an L&D business partner does, so that kind of query handling, um, analysis, you know, if you, have a mach if you have a bit of software that has natural language processing, um, can simulate human interaction, they don't have to be in an office. Um, they're in a virtual reality world. They're not humans. Why do you need a human? Now, running a mixed team of humans and non-humans, you know, now that is <laughs> mind-blowing. That's only potentially five to ten years away, I would say. I mean... Rip up but, the book and start again. So it's still the same answer to the question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> <but> <laughs> yes. oh. oh, sorry, missed you. I'll get you next. Um, Julie. So, so I think that's interesting, what you're saying. And I don't... The, the bit that sits uncomfortably with me is so many organisations, so many big organisations are really resilient to change. Mm -hmm. So even though there's lots and lots of disruptors, the behaviour uh, organisationally might be, well, we'll just buy them up and then we'll sort of dismantle them a bit or we'll put them over there somewhere where actually they don't get to reach their full potential. And when you were talking about big oil companies and some of the big, like pharmaceutical, you know, some of the remarkably resilient. So a lot of the future stuff that goes up there, I can't help feeling there's a bit of kind of cry wolf that sits around it. And I, 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 I puzzle with that. Mm -hmm. With my L&D hat on, I sit there and go, there's all this stuff that's out there. There's all this stuff that could be there for us to use for hopefully good rather than yeah. not good. And yet... I, I think we don't sometimes have the conversation about just how resilient some cultures are and resistant to change they are. And I, I think that's, <laughs> that's one of our challenges. I think for me, it um, depends on what your point of view is, whether this really is you know, some kind of perfect storm or point of inflection coming up. There's so many things going on in our environment that fundamentally there are going to be some shifts. So, or whether actually your point of view is, all right, maybe the pace of change is a bit faster, but you know, it's kind of business as usual, really, and, and our, you know, you know, traditional ways of doing things are resilient, you know, res you know, change-resistant cultures in large organizations um, um, will just shrug these things off. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we need to have a point of view. Um, my, my point of view is, I think that's a rather arrogant and dangerous belief to say, well, actually, you know, it's kind of, you know, uh, we don't need to worry about that. We're going to, you know, we're going to, so, you know, and I know that's perhaps not what you're saying there, Julie, but, but, but you know, the, how do we open the eyes of a large organization that has a change-resistant cu culture is a really tough challenge. Um, all I can say is it goes back to the kind of, for me, it goes back to the experimentation place. You've got to find places and corners in an organization to try things out and demonstrate the veracity of what you're doing and the veracity of a different approach. Because without that, in a change-resistant organization, nobody's going to buy in. You have to demonstrate the impact. Um, can I, so, so I think for us, one of our real important areas is um, diversity and inclusion. 
there's a lot, like people say, diverse teams outperform homogenous teams. Well, that's rubbish, right? So diverse teams outperform homogenous teams if they're well managed and they have good behaviors. That's when they perform well. The issue that I think companies have around diversity, they think, well, let's bring in diversity. Let's have more women, let's have more people of color, et cetera, et cetera. But their culture stops them from being different. They, they, they're told to conform. Um, so I think where you can get that start of the change is through diversity. However, it needs to be diversity and inclusion so that if I'm different, if I want to say different things, my manager doesn't shut me down and put me back in my box. If I want to dress like this, I can dress like this and nobody says no. So I think, I think that could be where you start for a change-resistant organization is that you start with diversity and then you start getting people with different opinions in, but you leave them have those opinions. And that's a lot of work to do with frontline managers. I, I absolutely agree on that. And I, I think part of, part of how we can be strategic in our leaders is helping them know how to hold that difference. Yes. And not just shut it down. And yes. No. And it's not just the leaders. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that so, so frontline managers have huge impact on our culture. They, they create it, you know, with, with a lot of people. Leaders do, but frontline managers are least experienced. They've probably had least experience around inclusion. So when somebody new and different comes in, they either shut them down or the person leaves. It doesn't matter. They still have no diversity and they still have no new ideas because it's the same people saying the same things. We like people who like ourselves, so that's, it's natural, you know? Mm. Um, so they, I think they really have to make that change. The guy in that book has a interesting, a, a, for me the most profound thing from that book, so you don't need to buy it, I'll tell you what it is. Um, 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 Kurt will is, not be happy. <laughs> and he won't. <laughs> Clearly I'm not on commission. Um, um, is the notion of microcultures, microcultures. So, you know, so just to the point, and every, you know, and many companies have done the research and there's lots out there about, you know, managers being the predominant driver. But, but the, you know, those, you know, manage, and not just managers, you, all of us, we set microcultures around us, the way we behave, the way we talk to one another, the way we make decisions, how much respect we hold for one another. We have microcultures, little bubbles around us, and managers, particularly so in organizations, hold the keys to those microcultures. Those microcultures, you know, many people say, well, how do I change the culture of an organization? I can't change the culture of this organization. And you, you can't force it from the top down. I mean, actually, you know, a, an organization's culture is an aggregation, is a synthesis of all these little microcultures across mm. the organization, whether they're geographic, functional, individual ones around them. And it's those kind of coming together of all those little you know, microcultures. So if you really want to change culture and organization, it's almost, you know, it's not impossible, because perhaps there are some examples of ones that have done it, but it's very difficult to do it top down and to mandate it and to just to make it. You make change happen, you make cultural change happen by changing those microcultures, which is a long and difficult process, and managers hold the keys to many of them. A lot of them, yeah. yeah. And, and our culture is interesting, is it is not it's not made by Mark and Cheryl. It's actually policed by, the, by everybody. So when people make the wrong decision and they act outside of our values, somebody tells them. It's not the manager necessarily. It's somebody who goes, that's not the way we do it around here. So it's self-policing. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a sum of all the thousands of decisions that all of us make every day. So what are the de decisions that your people make in your companies that wouldn't fit into the culture that you want. And, and the more that don't fit in, the worse your culture. Thank you, gents. There's a lady here. Hello. I work for one of the organizations um, that you described as the new old, so I work in banking. Um, and I think we're, we're at the bottom, and we've, the only way to go is up, and I think we're definitely there. We're at one of the most exciting times to work in the organization. There's two things we're doing at the moment on how we're changing how we build capability. One is around all our leaders were making coaches, and that, but the biggest thing is not just training them. They have to see that coaching and developing their staff is the core reason they're in their job. Um, and that's something we started, and even within nine months, having an amazing effect. Mm. The other one is peer-to-peer -peer learning. And we have Facebook at work. We have 30,000 people on that, Thank you. which is amazing. By the end of the year, we should have 100,000. Um, which is really good. And my thing was, just to answer your question, I like Facebook at work, but 
as I'm, I've got a team of about 110 people, I really don't want to know what they're doing at the weekend because yeah. that alters my view in the week of yeah, them sometimes, yeah. you know, and yeah. seeing some of their selfies and everything else. And I don't know if that's just a block I've got to get over. How do you cope with seeing pictures of <laughs> stuff you don't want to see <laughs> and then seeing them on the Monday and thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't got that image? So, so, th <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, that's a really good question. So again, so my first day in Facebook, and the second oldest person in Europe, I didn't know at the time. Uh, I'd just been told that my job had gone, and, uh, and they did have a job for me. Um, it, was, it was a mad... And then they said, um, so now, now we're, we're going to talk to you about Facebook, the product. And I started getting all of these friend requests from my boss, from my boss's boss, from people outside the, the, the new people. And the first thing I did was check my photos and start deleting them. And um, it's like, oh, man. But, but we were told, look, this is about authenticity. Um, this is about, we, we hired you for, for your whole self, not for your, for your work profile. So don't worry about it, you know? Like, just don't worry about it. Put up whatever you want to put up. Um, I think you have to be aware that your colleagues will see the certain things, but don't, don't try and, don't put up a work persona, just, just be yourself. Um, and there's an there's a, there's a interesting thing with Facebook at work, because obviously you don't see all of that personal stuff. And I think that uh, I think Facebook at work is fantastic for the communication, but you do miss out on some of the stuff that brings uh, brings teams closer together. I honestly I don't, I don't mind it at all. I skip through it. Um, people see me in photographs that doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't matter. But the scale effects of that kind of authenticity. I mean, so that if people really do bring their true selves yeah, to yeah. it, I mean, that opens the door to dealing with some of this unconscious bias and diversity yeah, yeah. stuff. Yes. So whilst, you know, for a newbie joining the company, I mean, I can see that's a bit of an eye-opening challenge yes. and a bit of a struggle. But at an organisational level, I mean, that's potentially hugely powerful. It is. It's absolutely, yeah, yeah. So again, if you look at our leaders, if you look at Mark and Cheryl and the stuff they shared openly about their bereavements, about their miscarriages, etc. You know, that, that sums up what we're about. It's, it's, it is about, you know, being really open, being, you know, being yourself. And if you're unhappy, then tell people you're unhappy. It's not all about, hey, this is fantastic. It's like, wow, I'm bereaving at the moment. It, is it bringing us back to the 80s? Not to be too old here, but in the 80s, oh, you went you. to work <laughs> events. You met families. The families came to work. You brought your kids to work. And then we all got separate and the budget cuts. And I almost think what you're talking about now it wasn't frightening in the 80s because you actually knew these people and you actually treated them better. Yeah. And you didn't have to tell a manager to be human because they thought about the child or the sick wife or something. So I think it's just kind of bringing the technology is now just getting us back to where we were in a way mm -hmm. mentally in the 80s, but doing it through technology, like mm -hmm. you guys are saying, we're headed in that direction too anyway. Yeah, so good well. I almost want to say, don't get so scared. It was kind of cool then. Yeah, yeah. Meeting the families and you yeah. know, I think we were nicer people at times. Yeah. We encourage everyone to bring the family in. Sorry, Jeff. I'm okay. just going to take one last one because we're coming up, coming up to the end now. Thank you. Um, so I think to the point about conservative organisations, one of the things that scares and excites me is that um, I see coming into the workforce, in the best sense of the world, word, one of the most demanding generations we've ever had. And they're coming in and they're saying, well, what's in it for me? Why am I got your old work patterns? Why are you doing it this way? And the conservative organisations are the ones who are going to lose people because they're going to come, they're going to, the newer generations are going to come in and say, I don't need to do this, I can go down the road to somebody else. I, I think you're right. I, 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 totally right. Um, I think that whatever you want to call them, the, the people who join the workforce now are being told you can do whatever you want to do. And if the organisations are not willing to offer them that, they'll either, they'll either go native eventually, they'll say, right, okay, I have to conform, or they'll leave. Um, but it doesn't matter because the conservative organisation will not get any new ideas and thoughts, etc. Um, I think previous generations would have conformed a lot more. They would have fitted in. These people, like, they don't care. Like, it's like, okay, I'll find someone else that, that will let me be myself. I was weary of wearing the mask that wasn't me. It's just a fantastic scene. Um, I, I want to offer one thing if we're wrapping, or if you're, I don't know if you want to take one other question or. Uh we're on to coffee break. Okay, okay. So, um, so I want to offer something that I hope will be useful to you. Um, in thinking about all of this and you think about what you do today and where your team spends its time and so on. Um, um, 
which is a different 70 20 10. You know, we have you know, Charles doing his stuff outside about um, 70 20 10 and so on, and, and you know, as LD people, we know all about that. That's, that's great. This is a resource allocation 70 20 10. So if you read the books on Google, you know, Eric Schmidt will say, you know, this is how Google runs its business, and, you know, and, and so on. Um, um, that um, probably is true. Um, I'm not sure that was my experience, but, but the model is really powerful, which is so if you think about where you're spending your time, where you're spending your headcount, where you're spending your dollars, the resources that you have, probably the most critical resource is your time and your brain space. But if you think about you know, the totality of that number, you know, where are you spending your time? So this model would argue you need to spend about 70% of your time on you know, ongoing product development. Um, so your ongoing services and activities that you provide to service the business. You probably want to spend about 20% of your time on new emerging kind of um, you know things you know perhaps stuff you know that are strategic you're 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 responding to needs from the business and so on, but you should be spending you need to keep a slither open you need to keep it just ten percent open for the truly new the new new, because if you don't keep a space open for the new new you'll never get to to the point in which you're dealing with some of this stuff that we've been talking about here because you'll be consumed with the seventy and with the twenty. So I guess my kind of, you know, kind of offer or provocation to you is, are you spending, have you got, in, you know, have you got your 10%? Where is that time? You know, if we talk about if these meta-level capabilities really are the ones that unlock the door to the future for organizations, or even if you only half believe that, but nevertheless, it's worth taking a punt on it. You need to be spending some of your precious resources on this, and I bet most organizations aren't. So... You look at a Facebook or a Google or you know, some of these other companies, they're spending most of their time. Where does L&D spend its time? It spends its time on these sorts of things. So where are you? And if you're not, make sure you do. You know, how you do it, whether you squirrel it away, whether you make it legitimate, but you need to spend some of your time on this stuff. So think 70-20-10, different 70-20-10 from, from, from Charles. Thank you. That sounds like a call to action to me. Can you please, before you go, show your appreciation to Stefan and Jeff? <laughs>